Hey, we're back with David Timms, and I left you all in the dark a little bit last time. We just touched on transformational leadership, which is David's model for leadership. I want to hear Professor Timms, Dean of the School of Leadership, have you describe what this model is and why it's so impactful. Yeah, you know, it's... uh... It's one of those things that I've discovered just a few years ago, but it is 30 years old. Um, So the model of transformational leadership in in academic circles, at least, goes back to the late 70s. So it's it's 40 years old. A couple of fellows uh, at that point in time were exploring it, just when others were exploring servant leadership as a different model. There are tons of models out there, transactional leadership, authoritative leadership, values-based leadership, and so on. You know, these fellows uh, gave it all academic jargon that I don't think many of us can remember. <laughs> um, but surprisingly for a lot of people, this model of transformational leadership has been the dominant leadership model for 40 years. And of course, from Christian circles, we're inclined to think surely not because we're used to hearing about servant leadership a great deal more. Um, but in the marketplace, this has been the dominant model. So all I've done is taken an older, older model given a language that is faithful to its original pillars, but language that we can memorize and remember a little bit more easily. So my definition, David, very briefly, is that transformational leadership uh, is producing change and building lives. That's the outcome. And we do that through authenticity, inspiration, empathy, and innovation. They're the four, the four pillars that produce the outcome of producing change and building lives. And that package, if you like, captures 40 years 40 plus years of academic research, marketplace verification, and a lot of academic writing. And I've simply tried to capture it and make it a bit more usable by uh, the person on the street. So dive into the first one, the authenticity. Talk talk to me about that. And I think if I remember in the book, you gave kind of an interesting example of a lack of authenticity um, when you started out the chapter, but you can start there or go somewhere else. But talk to me about authenticity. Why is that so important as the first pillar? Well, and and authenticity is one of those things that Brene Brown is talking about a lot these days. So here she is 40 years later saying, hey, this is this is really significant. Vulnerability and authenticity is is her shtick. Um, and it's not just hers, it's it's what we all are agreeing matters to the kind of leadership that we really want. And authenticity is simply just be able to say we project who we really are. There's not a duplicity about us. What you see is is who I am. Um, I'm not a different way around other employees or around other members of the organization or the family. I am authentically me. And there's various components to that, various parts to that. But really, it is living a life that is not filled with duplicity because all of us can smell out hypocrisy and duplicity in a heartbeat. Uh, We've got radars for that sort of thing. And um, we just know that when we run into leaders like that who are not honest but are dishonest, who are not transparent but are secretive and so on and so forth, uh, that's not a person that we'll follow. And so that is not a person who will be able to either produce change or build our lives. So authenticity is is this sort of genuine um, expression of who I am. Okay, and then on on page 74, you had a quote, you said, that really struck me. You compared authenticity to, to duplicity. I'm not gonna read the duplicity part, but you said authenticity it makes us whole. It unites our words and our actions and thereby strengthens the soul. I thought that was really powerful. I mean, but how do I translate that into something I do each day? Well, for me, what that means, David, is that we don't do anything that's not true to ourselves. Um, I, I think a lot of us know when we're walking both sides of the line. Um, when we are one way with one group and another way with another group. It's a tough way to live, in fact. Uh, We may not put these words to it, but it's a very stressful way to live, right? Because you've got different folk looking at us saying, why aren't you fair with us in the same way you're fair with them? Uh, Why do you use different language with us? Why are you demeaning with us when you're very affirming to them? Um, Why are you compassionate with them and not with us? And and, and so we, we don't warm to people who have that kind of duplicity. And I don't warm to myself. 
So for me, this authenticity is about wholeness. It's about me being whole. And never mind the people around me, it's about me actually living a life that flourishes. Uh, this is just a pathway to a flourishing life for me and the people around me. So I'm curious, one of the key components that you list early on in the authenticity piece is being transparent. So how do you find that balance where you're transparent enough, but not too transparent? And as you brought it, you know, where you're doing, you're, multi, you're working with multiple groups and treat, try to treat everybody the same. You're not kind of being a chameleon where you're changing colors, you know, moving to blend in. So for me, transparency is really about um, just putting it all out there. It's, it's sort of having, having no secrets. Uh, it's the antithesis. It's the opposite of that lifestyle that says, hey, the way I do business as a leader is divide and conquer. Some of us have been in those environments uh, in the workplace where we've had leaders above us um, who might be better described as bosses than leaders, right, given my definition. Uh, we've had people in authority above us whose, whose philosophy is divide and conquer, for whom, you know, the politics of knowledge is everything. And I let you know a little bit, but I don't tell you everything because then that keeps you a little off kilter. And I tell the next person a little bit different or a little bit more, but I don't tell them everything either. I'm, I've got to be the holder of the secret because I'm afraid that I'll relinquish power if I'm not complete, if I, if I am completely transparent. I'm going, again, it's no way to live. It's no way to lead. Um, if transparency is about the non-secret lifestyle, um, if transparency is about saying, I will not live with the politics of knowledge, then uh, this, this is very transformational, both for me and for the culture around me. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because I was just reading back in, in my first book, um, Success of People, I gave an example of Nucor Steel for their compensation program. And Nucor is the largest steel producer in the, UA, the United States and the largest mini mill, mini mill, that's a, I say that fast three times, mini mill producer, I believe in the world. And, but in 1962, they were nothing. And they bought this steel company and put a guy named Ken Iverson in charge. And what he did was he went non-union, which was unheard of. And he paid his people based on productivity goals. And then said, go for it and, you know, earn as much money as you want. So the result was that new core steel employees, non-union employees made more than union people. And they had transparency into all the numbers right. that affected their compensation. And that's why it worked. Was they, they had that and they had what you were talking about, the authenticity where they knew they could trust management. So it wasn't us versus them type of thing. Now, another thing you, you talk about is humility. So where do you find that, that balance? Again, I'll, I'll bring up that balance of humility. I mean, if you're too humble, people walk all over you. <laughs> if, if you're not humble at all, then you're the boss I think you were talking about before. <laughs> so how do you kind of assess as an individual who's getting all these messages that you're not good enough um, or that you're, you're great? So you're trying to build your self-esteem. How do you balance the humility in there and find it when you get all these conflicting messages all day long? Yeah, gee, that's, that's kind of a million-dollar question, isn't it? Because uh, humility is maybe not a skill to learn as a, as a character trait to, to gradually develop. You won't wake up tomorrow and say, today's the day I'm going to become humble. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's not going to happen. So I do think that humility and integrity, I'll put those two together, though they are different, I'll put them together. Humility and integrity really are a part of this uh, authenticity. Uh, for me, um, steps toward greater humility. You, you cannot be humble if you're not first of all secure. So the least humble people, generally speaking, are also the least secure people. Uh, they've got to have the attention, they've got to get the accolades, they've got to hoard the attention of other people. So how do you develop humility? You do the opposite of those things. Um, if you're not humble, you won't accept blame. If you want to become humble, accept the blame, take responsibility. So I'll put my hand up. It wasn't my fault directly, but, you know, put, put it on me, lay it on my shoulders. Um, I was talking to someone the other day, David, about uh, giving credit. 
And someone said, yeah, but if, you, if you're always deflecting credit to someone else, you know, you'll never get noticed. Um, you'll never move up. And, and I found the opposite to be true. That in fact, that the more you give, the more you get. If you give credit to people around you, if you keep deflecting credit to your team, you'll be amazed, not you, but our listeners will be amazed how much of that credit comes back in backhanded ways. Um, you know, I hear constantly people say, hey, folk on your team say this about you. I don't put them up to that. I don't ask for that. But I'm constantly deflecting to them as, as a way to try and step into this character trait. I do think this is core. And it's not me. Jim Collins says level five leaders uh, show humility. You want to be the best of the best of the best. Then humility is core to that. How do we develop it? By doing the opposite things that, um, that pride would, would invite us to do. Yeah, when Collins, uh, when I read Collins' book, Good to Great, and he came out that that was the, the, the number one trait or the only trait that all those good to great CEOs had I was really struck by the diversity of industries that they were in. I mean, you had R.J. Reynolds making cigarettes to kill people. You had, you had deer making tractors. You had, you know, this and that. And it was, it was quite diverse. So as, as we wrap up this session on authenticity, what would you challenge people to think about if they're thinking about, okay, am I really as authentic as I should be? What, 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 what path should they take to kind of, become more authentic or what's a step they can take? Yeah, I, I think to ask some hard questions of ourselves and just say, you know, how do I grow in humility and integrity? How much do they matter to me? And how do I grow in them? Uh, how transparent am I with the people around me? And how much do I want to hoard knowledge and use it as a, as a, as a source of power? Um, I, I think they're the kind of questions we begin to ask of ourselves. And in the journey in that direction, we find ourselves becoming increasingly authentic as individuals. And, you know, the, the flip side of this is that uh, the less there is of me, the more there is of me. That's a great paradox in all of this. And authenticity produces that. I really don't want to say anything after that quote, because you can ponder that quote for like four hours, probably, and just, you know, noodle it around. So anyway, thanks, David, for this one. Uh, transformational leadership, we covered authenticity. Whew, barely got that one out. That's good. So anyway, look forward to join, having you back for the next, the second pillar of your transformational leadership model. Thank you.